On March 1, 1910, 96 people were killed in what was then and is still now, 109 years later, the worst avalanche in United States history. <laughs> Six days before, on Wednesday, February 23rd, a set of trains were on a routine trip on the Great Northern Railway's mainline route, going from the Twin Cities in Minnesota to Seattle, Washington. These trains were transporting a mix of passengers and mail across the Cascadian Mountains of northwestern Washington. Although they were delayed on Wednesday, they continued on because this was the exact conditions which the Snow King model was designed for, and for the crew, this route seemed nothing out of the ordinary. That was until the snow, rather than easing, kept coming and was always more. I had never seen a storm like this one, reported Nike Homnillo, a Great Northern Rail employee. Snow was 8 to 10 feet, and in places it drifted 15 to 20 feet high. They began to get bogged down, and it was at Stephens Pass, near the small company town of Wellington, that they were forced to stop. Although teams were sent out to try to clear the snow, this turned out to be a wasted effort, because, even as they worked, more and more snow fell, to the point where they weren't even stopping the build-up. Compounding this dilemma was the constant loss of crew, seeing how futile their effort was, and knowing they would only get 15 cents, less than $4 by today's standards, per hour of this grueling work, many of them simply left. They would need to wait for the storm to break before they could start carving their path forwards once again. The situation slowly deteriorated, as their supplies, which had never meant to last so long without resupply, began to dwindle. Things were only made worse when on Saturday the 26th the telegraph lines went down, cutting off communication with the outside world. Things became more deadly as the light snow turned to heavy freezing rain which weighed down the snow. Two days later, on the 28th, the rainstorm became a thunderstorm. As the days passed with no end to the storm in sight, some attempted to get back on foot. Most, however, expecting a comfortable journey, had brought only light clothing and so had to rely on the quickly vanishing supplies and protection provided by the trains. Remembering what happened, William Flannery, who was the telegraph operator in Wellington at the time, said this, At 12.05, I woke up and saw a flash of lightning zigzag across the sky, and then another, and then there was a loud clap of thunder. The next thing I knew, I heard someone yelling. We got up and climbed down the bank to where the trains had been knocked by the slide. I saw a man laying in the snow, and I went and got him and put him on my back. And while I started up the hill, another slide hit and knocked me down underneath it, and I lost this man. I was sort of dazed and was underneath the snow of some 10 or 15 feet. I started to dig and climb along the side of a tree, and I finally got out. And I was in such a dazed condition that I walked down and walked into the river up to my shoulders when I came to and realized what I had done. The residents of Wellington quickly began digging out the survivors and managed to get 23 people out in time to save their lives, although most of them were heavily injured by the violence of the avalanche. In the next few days, as the word spread across the country, 150 people came to uncover the trains and figure out what happened. In the coming days, it was found that the thunder must have caused a shock, which combined with the heavy snows and the icy wet conditions, led to an avalanche. It was the perfect mix in the perfect place for such a disaster. After being hit with the initial wave and knocked off the tracks, the rail cars would roll several times into a steep decline towards the Tyre River. They were then buried in 40 to 150 feet of snow, ice, trees, and boulders. After the work was done, it was determined that of the 119 people caught in the avalanche, 96 were killed, consisting of about two-thirds Great Northern Rail employees and one-third of passengers. In the end, less than one in five would survive the avalanche. If you would like to learn more about this topic, I would point you to the two articles which I consulted most heavily while researching this piece. They are by Greg Lang of HistoryLink.org and Linda Mapes of SeattleTimes.org. Most of the photographs shown are courtesy of the archival site set up by Bob Kelly of the United States Forest Service. Please leave a like and comment. By clicking the link on screen, you can also watch the previous Hesmage history about the time of troubles and the origins of the Romanov dynasty.